Um, anyway, what we're going to discuss today is the implications of climate change for Nebraska. And there'll be a few surprises, I think, because there has been a lot of uh, dialogue that makes it sound like the sky is falling around everything. And to be quite honest, it's not falling down around everybody. So the seminar outline, I'll give a current state of Nebraska's climate, uh, give you the trends within the past century. I'm gonna spend a good deal of amount of time on the perceptions of climate change because one of the big issues within our community is being able to communicate the, the sensed changes in the environment in a way that the stakeholders, the residents of the state can understand and to empathize with. Uh, then we'll look at Nebraska's climate outlook. Um, we'll talk briefly about breaking the biome forcing habit, which is trying to grow things or make things grow or um, thrive here that really don't belong here. And then last is the positive stakeholder response, things that stakeholders within the state can do uh, to ready themselves or to mitigate any changes in the climate. Just a brief background on the data that I'm going to be using. I'm a, I am a, a data person. Uh, I, I thrive with lots of data. And for that reason, I'm a very familiar with the National Centers for Environmental Information, NCI. It used to be called the NCDC, National Climatic Data Center. And obviously, working in the candy store of the Nebraska Mesonet, I'm going to use our own data. I will say that I use the Nebraska Mesonet data as a verification tool so that when I looked at NCEI's data, I was verifying that the same trends that I was seeing there are ones that we we're seeing within our own mesonet. Uh, data normalization, uh, point data is converted to a fixed grid using a Barnes objective analysis. Um, and this is done as we're going to discuss a little bit here because point data is transient. Stations open and close throughout the life history of the observational network. And one way to get around that is we're gonna create a grid and we're gonna interpolate all these different stations to that grid depending whether they exist or not. That way that single point always exists regardless of the stations around it, how they, they come in and out. We also uh, treat each day as its own statistical element throughout time. So each year, if you look at the Julian day of any particular year, that is its own column and it's irrespective of its neighboring days. And that's important because that allows you to use a lot more data than if you were dependent upon a serial of complete data set. Uh, climatological statistics are calculated over a running 33 year period instead of a 30 year period. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain why. The focus is on temperature and precipitation. I don't do wind because wind on a daily scale um, as a meteorologist, I'll tell you is almost irrelevant. You really need to look at wind on an hourly scale. And the period of record uh, that I have that's, a, that's viable is 1893 to 2021 um, with full coverage of the state starting in 1898. So going back to this grid resolution problem here is this is the exact grid that I used to interpolate all the stations that I had access to. Those become fixed data points. They're regularly spaced and they're spaced in such a way as to defeating what is known as the Richard, Richardson effect. Um, this goes back to the turn of the 19th century. There was a, a budding numerical modeler who filled a room in India full of uh, mathematicians and abacus, and they, abacai, abacus, and they attempted to run manually a numerical weather model in this huge room with all these mathematicians. And what they discovered, and what is still true today, is when you try to resolve a regular grid tighter than your observational network, any error that is uh, implemented into that calculation explodes over time. In other words, it, it makes your result bogus. Uh, the grid is extended well past the border to mitigate any edge interpolation errors. And finally, the grid mitigates temporal transient observation points, which we had talked about. Each day of the year is treated as its own individual statistic entity. 
Uh, the only other point I was going to add is we do have leap years because our orbit around the sun is not exactly uh, ends on a day. It's actually a quarter of a day, actually a little bit less than a quarter of a day or more of a quarter of a day. And so for that reason, uh, going from the end of a year to the next year where you have a leap year, you just interpolate temporally that data set. Statistically, it still correlates within 0.992. The other aspect that we have is extraterrestrial influences and solar activity is the, pri is the primary one. Uh, solar activity, um, the periodicity is generally on very large scale, much larger scale than our in pseudo observations go back. There is an exception and that is sunspot activity. Uh, we have records going back to the 1760s, 16, uh, 1763, that show sunspot activity is on an 11-year cycle. And for that reason, to wash that out, the climatology that I generated is on a 33-year climatology. That is to wash out the effects of sunspots on the observations that we're seeing here. And now I'm going to get into the state of the climate. Uh, very generally, Nebraska sits uh, about 50 degrees as a average over a whole year, uh, deviates from that degree either way from the center part of the state. Um, annual average liquid precipitation, you start with about 35 inches in the very southeast corner and you end up at 15 inches at the very western edge of the panhandle. It's not terribly exciting because we don't have a lot of topographical effects that uh, influence that precipitation other than the upslope. Uh, other aspects of our climate uh, that are current is the annual total snowfall. Um, it's the least in the southeast corner and the most in the northwest corner. Uh, just another uh, part of what we like to look at from a climate standpoint is how many days are over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is, um, is centralized over the southwest corner of the state, with the northeast corner of the state being the ones that least likely have uh, days over 100 degrees. And then being on an ag campus, everybody's concerned about when can you plant and when do you have to have your crops harvested by. Um, average last frost date uh, in the spring is in April and May, and the average first frost date is in October and the very western edge of uh, the Panhandle, September. To kind of give you a temporal aspect, so all those grid points you saw earlier, when I talk about an integrated Nebraska value, all I'm doing is I'm summing up and then obviously dividing by the number of grid points, which is 130, all those points that are within the boundary of Nebraska. So this is a single integrated product for the whole state a very generic look at the state. And so this gives you a temporal look throughout the course of a year of the rise and fall of the temperatures. And on, the, uh, on my left-hand side, you'll have the max, mean, and low temperatures throughout the year. Um, probably a little more exciting is the precip in the sense that you get to see when most of the precip falls in Nebraska, um, which is in June and July. You do have a secondary bump in the fall. And you can also see from when the snowfall occurs versus the snow depth maximum that, especially in the late spring, that what snow falls typically melts right away. So you don't have an accumulation. Transversely in the fall, you have some snow that comes in early and it'll melt before it accumulates when it gets cold. The trends over the past century, and this is where we start to get a little more interesting because you've gotten a lot of dialogue about global warming and even warming within the state of Nebraska. Uh, in 2014, there was a climate report that came out that indicated that there had been a one degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature from 1895 until 2010 when that report's data uh, ended. Um, to me, it's a little bit of a cherry picking because they didn't actually resolve enough stations in 1895 in order to properly integrate for the whole state. So it'd be difficult to really say that. I did not find that. In, fa in fact, if you look at the data, you can see that it actually was warmer across the state of Nebraska for the first half of the last century than it, than it is now. Um, I also plotted here 
uh, the, the average low temperature, because this is kind of where you start to see where is the energy with greenhouse gas absorption, the long wave radiation that's being uh, absorbed near the surface, what is that going into? And when you start to look at the low temperature, the morning low, and see that those are increasing. In fact, what our lows now are, are the highest that they've ever been recorded. It's because of moisture. It takes more energy to heat moist air than dry air. If you've ever been to the desert, you've noticed that. It gets hot during the day, but it cools off very rapidly as soon as that sun sets. We are seeing an influx of moisture into the planet. I went ahead, the very bottom graph is just to show you the monthly uh, sunspot activity, just to show you there's not a real heavy correlation with sunspot activity when you wash that out. Precipitation is really uh, illustrated as far as the moistening of the plains is what I like to call this. Instead of, instead of Nebraska climate change, it's, it's almost Nebraska moistening event. And ever since 1940, our uh, precipitation rates across the state have been increasing. Um, snowfall did increase up until 1980s, then it dropped off. And I think that you're going to see that that's mostly due to the warming and the, and, um, the snow depth has also dropped off. I went ahead and I plotted here the low temperature that you saw earlier, along with the precipitation. So you can see the correlation between the two that as the average low temperature rises, so does the precipitation rate. And then also in the middle is the frost-free days. And you can see that we've gained, uh, since the, the uh, 1900s, we've gained almost a full week of growing, uh, uh, growing season. So now we're gonna get into the perceptions of climate change. And this is the important part because we can do the science all day long, but if you can't communicate that in a way that effectively reaches your audience, the people that can make decisions, the people that live it, then what did you do your science for? And so when you look at this, the first thing you'll notice is that the, the trend line is actually negative. When, and, and before you get real excited, understand that this entire graph is less than a degree. You're going from 9.5 to 10.1. So there's, over the long haul, there hasn't been a huge change in our annual average temperature. But what change there is, is a decrease when you look at the total record. And you can see that reflected upon the climatologies of the, of the two time periods. I've got an 1898 to 1930 average annual temperature, and I've got the same for 1988 to 2020. There's very little change. It has warmed up in the Northwest a little bit, but for the most part, it's the same. There hasn't been a great deal of change. So this is where perception comes in. If somebody was born just prior to 1930, their perception of the climate of Nebraska. They lived here, they worked outside, they, whatever they did within the state, that they've been observant enough to notice any trends at all. What they've actually noticed is from the time that they were a kid until current, it's actually gotten cooler in their mind. Now you have to take into account how good is their memory? How much do they remember when they were six or five years old? But understand the trend line is such that in their mind, if they were to take into account the average of all the things that occurred during their lifetime, they really don't see global warming because they don't see local warming. So let's go to 1940, because we're, a lot of folks that have been born around 1930 have, uh, have unfortunately passed. So now we're into another group. You still see that decrease in the temperature from their frame of reference. It's less so than the previous slide, but it's still a decrease. It's not warming. It is, in their frame of reference, cooling. 1950, we start to flatten out. So anybody born around that time period, to their point of view, there's been extremes. But from their point of view, you can really see, especially around 1980, it was cooler. They remember ice skating on ponds that now never ice. And that's what's fresh in their memory. Now, 1960s, we're starting to turn and we're starting to see that trend towards warming even locally. 
Uh, in this case, it's ever so slight. Um, you're, you're still talking about 0 0.0045 degrees per year, very slight, but it is an increase. So those people now are starting to perceive perhaps it is getting warm. 1970s, anybody born around that time period? This is gonna be my generation is yes, now you definitely see a trend towards when I was a kid, I could remember ice fishing in 12, 13 inches of ice. And now that's something that doesn't happen, but maybe once every 10 years. Finally, 1980s, this is going to hedge into a group of young people that are dynamically interested in climate change, politically active in it, and it's because their perception is it's always been warming. They don't have a perception of the 60s and the early 70s when it was cool. And it's important to notice who your audience is and how it is you're going to address this data and what it means. This is just a, a, a recapture of what I've said, but one thing to note, people born from 1960, 1970, 1980, the big trend you can see there is the increase in acceleration of warming. So now the Nebraska Climate Outlook. And this is just to, for those who are not familiar with the science, with the greenhouse gas projections, they're based upon the energy that's retained near the surface as opposed to being reflected back out into space. And that's because greenhouse gases by their nature are absorptive of energy in the long way. Shortwave radiation from the sun is absorbed with the atmosphere, uh, in the atmosphere and surface, and re emitted as long wave radiation, and that's where the, the greenhouse gases come into play. More is absorbed, the more that is present. As a climate scientist, we talk about this using RCPs or representative concentration pathways. And a lot of people will see these numbers and they won't know fully what they mean. And when you see the value like 2.6, 3.2, what they refer to is an expression of the amount of long wave radiation that's retained near the surface because of the addition of those gases at the surface. It's an articulable way of adding energy into the equation to determine what the temperature will be into the future just based upon the greenhouse gas concentration. Projections of 2.6, uh, as an example, we refer to 2.6 watts per meter squared. That's a flux that goes through a surface. It's two dimensional. Um, when this started to be discussed, an RCP of 2.6 was the goal. And it's now considered unattainable. And most uh, current policymakers are concentrating on this 3.5. COVID-19 pandemic did bring a about a brief respite. Uh, people didn't travel. Uh, a lot of goods were not transported. And for there's a blip, and we even saw it in the data that I showed earlier, where there's a, a little bit of a tick downwards, and that's a COVID dip. But what we're starting to see now in the monitoring stations near the surface with CO2 is an accelerated uptick in CO2 emissions because an overcorrection in the commercial activity to make up for what was lost during COVID. And if there was ever an RCP 8.6, this is my attempt at humor. This is actually a billboard that somebody uh, put up in, in Austin, Texas. Uh, I don't know if you can tell it, but the, the meteor is falling and, and the dinosaurs go draft the economy. So focusing on the near term, with an RCP of 4.5 watts per meter squared, you would see a shift in the integrated Nebraska climate parameters by the year 2050, where the annual average high temperature would increase by 0 0.3 degrees C or half of a degree Fahrenheit. The annual average low temperature increase would be almost a full degree Fahrenheit. And the aver annual average precipitation increase as an integral part over the state would be uh, 1.2 inches. On the surface, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but understand that this is an integrated product that's averaged over a year. That is actually averaged over 33 years. 
So when you take that into account, your range is going to be quite large. And that's part of the, the issue that we're going to see in the future of Nebraska is that part of that range is going to be episodic droughts as well as episodic floods, because you're going to have more energy available for both heating on the dry years and for moisture during the wet years. The last time Nebraska witnessed the same average annual high temperature was for the 33 period ending in 1952. And as an example here, you can see that the average days where the daily high was above 100 degrees, especially in the southern part of the state, was a full month, 30 days that they reached over 100 degrees. The shift in that high temperature paradigm is from the south central Nebraska northward. A little bit different though, when you start talking about the shift in the low temperature paradigm, that shift is from the Southeast to the Northwest. Uh, so that your average annual low temperature for Nebraska would go up to 37.7, only three degrees more uh, Celsius. But I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. It's 3.16 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's, uh, significantly more when you take that over the span of the entire state of Nebraska. And what that does is when you calculate the amount of absolute humidity, and absolute humidity is a measured by how many grams of water in a cubic meter of atmosphere. That goes up a lot. So your precipitable water potential is much higher. Is that gonna be realized all the time? No, and that's gonna be the biggest problem is that you're gonna have uh, episodal flooding events, there are going to be longer periods of time between them, but when they do occur, they're going to be significant. And then they're also going to be uh, punctuated with these episodic, short, but very intense droughts. The average annual precipitation paradigm, as we talked about, is going to be in a, in a paradigm that Nebraska as a whole hasn't seen before. It's going to be something more akin to Arkansas. Uh, southeast Missouri. So breaking the biome forcing habit, one of the things that we like to do in agriculture is we like to make things grow that possibly shouldn't be grown in a place. Uh, Nebraska is a world leading producer of beef, animal feed, and biomass for ethanol. And the two questions that can be asked about any practice is, should you and can you? Should you is a politically loaded question. It's on the same order as should you get a vaccine? Should you wear a mask? I'm not gonna go there in this presentation. I'm gonna concentrate on the can you from a climatological standpoint. So if with the projections using a 4.5 watts per meter square, you're gonna have a greatly increased hazard of cattle loss by 2050 due to heat stress and episodic droughts, which are correlated with feed loss, particularly for finishing operations. There is an emphasis in the United States, especially in the Great Plains, to finish in concentrated feedlots with grains, distillers, grains, corn. And those operations are confined. They're susceptible to disease and lack of air movement. And they also happen to be a, a huge source for other non-greenhouse gas emissions, such as ammonia and nitrate. Those are particularly gonna be at risk by 2050 due to climate change. There's gonna be a decreased maize production with pollination deficits caused by increased daytime high temperature and the lack of morning low recovery temperature. For pollination on corn to be effective, it has to get below 80 degrees. And we're gonna to start to see warnings in the Great Plains where it is not gonna get below 80 degrees. And a dew point of 80 or more is going to be commonplace. Rangeland management will be problematic with natural afforestation pressure, particularly in the Eastern two thirds of Nebraska. If any of you have been in Nebraska long enough or are familiar with Nebraska, in the springtime, we have this tradition where we breathe Kansas smoke. And that is due to the fact that the flood hills have to burn every year in order to keep up with clearing out the natural afforestation pressure. That is only going to come and visit us. 
Um, if we follow that same paradigm, we're gonna see a decrease in air quality plus an addition of greenhouse gas emissions just from the burning of that, of that pasture with those trees. And then episodic drought will bring larger scale fire danger to all of Nebraska. And as an example, and I, I farm here in Eastern Nebraska, uh, we had a fire come within um, 30 feet of an outbuilding of ours that swept uh, for six miles straight for a half mile wide before it was under control. Doesn't, doesn't seem to scale well when you compare it to California, but I tell you what, it is pretty scary when you're looking straight at it and you see this huge wall of fire moving across cedar trees and corn residue um, it is just gonna become more problematic. So what are the positive things that stakeholders can do? Well, this is kind of a, a 1940s idea that we need to revisit. And that's the whole idea of diversifying our income pathways as ranchers, farmers, landowners, thinking outside of the box in ways that we can bring money into our operations so that we can be economically viable. Um, adapt afforestation to desired species for timber and food. This is a big one because I see afforestation to be a huge concern for especially Eastern Nebraska landowners. And you're already seeing it. I see it on my farm. See red cedars that just have, they grow rapidly and they set in pretty quickly. Reacquire seal grain production for animal feed and food. Nebraska used to be the wheat basket. Then it was found to be more profitable to have corn and soybeans because of how many bushels you can get per acre. If you look Kansas, south of us, where they see those daytime highs and those morning lows don't get below 80 now, they're growing wheat. They don't grow a lot of corn in Kansas. And that's because of this. And this is something that we need to accept maybe in our future. Uh, utilize marginal production areas for energy production, solar and wind. I know it's a dirty word for some people, but if you've got ground that isn't being used for anything else and you have to make a dollar off of it, this is a viable expression of your economic need. The other aspect is, is we're gonna have an increased awareness of fire danger. You're gonna have a lot of green years in succession, and then it's gonna be followed by an episodic drought. Well, what do green years do is they build up biomass. When that biomass dries down, it becomes a huge fire hazard. Investment in fire response and suppression through communications, equipment, and resource management, as well as access and enhancement. There are plays places out in the sand hills that are very difficult to get to and it can only be got to by the air. And that's something that needs to be uh, addressed and, and put into implementation as far as being able to uh, quickly respond to large fires. And then finally, we need to reduce or phase out practices with high risk. And this includes migration from concentrated finishing operations to open rangeland finishing. That is one way for the beef industry to stay viable in Nebraska is to look at the other alternatives to finishing those uh, calves out before they go to processors. And that's all I have. Thank you. And I'm ready for questions. Thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I assume that your predictions, your projections for climate um, don't fully account for wild parts like uh, changes in atmospheric circulation or something larger on the global scale um, that could change regional climate in a different way, put it on a different trajectory. And there's some indication that that could be happening in some parts of the world, um, at least my limited understanding of that. What does that mean for Nebraska? Is it a, do you see that as a potential issue or not so much because of its location in terms of things like teleconnections and those changing if, if the structure of the climate system somehow changes ocean or atmospheric circulation? As a meteorologist, uh, I, I 
absolutely uh, look at our moisture source. Our, our moisture source is the Gulf of Mexico for the most part. We get very little moisture that comes in over across the Rockies. It gets milked out. There's not a large scale circulation within the Western Gulf that affects our moisture source. But having said that, breakdown in oceanic currents, which have been modeled to be more than probable coming up forward with, with global warming. Um, it may not have a direct impact, but it's gonna have an indirect impact. And I see um, pressures being exerted mostly in the food production aspect in that regions of the world which are continental enough yet reside say for instance the black seas another or caspian seas another example if you've got a moisture stock and you're able to still get advected moisture in so that you can raise seal grains and such there's going to be more pressure exerted on you or that group to produce food over those that are marginally or more affected by maritime climate, especially when you start look, talking about oceanic current breakdown. I guess you could say we're a little bit lucky just by the fact that we are so far from anything oceanic, but, um, and the fact that also the, the, the Gulf of Mexico is, a, is our most significant source of moisture, but it also is not driven by currents at the Western edge of the Gulf. Oh. My question is related to the interpolation techniques. You use the same interpolation for precipitation and temperature? I use the, the interpret, yes. All parameters use the, the same interpolation techniques for climate data. For both parameters, temperature and precipitation? For, for precipitation and what's the other one? Temperatures, low temperature. Yes, yes. And uh, why do you use the same technique? Basically, there are different type of anomalies and different uh, parameters that affect the temperature and precipitation. Yes, so precipitation is a very discrete phenomenon. I'm gonna probably cut right to the chase of, of what your question is. Precipitation is a very discrete phenomenon. You can actually have zero precipitation and then you go from there and you have actually a binary, yes, you have precipitation, where temperature is a fluid. It is on a, on a gradient across the, uh, an area. You don't have a wall per se where 50 degrees stops and you immediately go to 30 degrees. In a meteorological sense, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that I do within my job is we take NEXRAD uh, estimated precipitation precipitation data down to the one kilometer scale, we do some ground truthing with our network to verify it, but that is a very discrete set of values for each kilometer that's there. When you start to look at long-term climatological data, you're looking at trends. You're not looking for discrete edges, especially in Nebraska. Now you get into other geographies that's gonna be different because you have topological effects. But in Nebraska, the gradient is such, you, you have such a lack of topography that you can use that same utility across the 33 year span. But on a, on a shorter scale, time scale, or in a, a variable um, elevation situation, you wouldn't be able to do that. Well, I'm kind of lucky in the sense that we can do that here, but you, you cannot apply the same techniques to everywhere. Should you want me to go ahead and oh, I, I, I see the one. Um, okay, this is um, from Dr. Um, Sagai up on Drought Mitigation Center. What would be the most critical issue on Nebraska because of climate change? How uh, could we mitigate? And, um, and again, this kind of gets back to the question, should you and, and can you? And I, I'm really reticent to address the should you because uh, it, it's a political hot potato. But on the can you, as far as trying to keep the economy viable 
for those who own land, who, who farm now, ranch now, um, diversification. And, and it's interesting because the University of Nebraska is, is rooted very heavily in extension. And if you go back to early extension practices or processes that were educated out going back into the 30s and 40s and 50s, what they would tell farmers and ranchers then is diversify, diversify, diversify. Now, when they talked about diversification back then, they were talking about, well, you should have a few hogs, you should have a few cattle, some chickens, you should have wheat, maybe put some oats in, some corn maybe. When I talk about diversification, I'm talking about a larger portfolio where you're talking, you can convert land to energy production through solar and wind. You can look at afforestation processes, growing nut trees, orchards, especially in East Nebraska, it's gonna be climatologically viable to do those things. And it has been already in Nebraska City for a very long time. That's gonna only expand to the North and West. And one big thing that I would like to emphasize is the idea of, of growing local for local consumption. The climate is gonna be as such that the, the, the little corner pickup with the watermelons and the, and, the, and the corn and such, that can become a larger operation to fill supermarkets that are local to us. You cut down on transportation costs. You also have a fresher product that drives a local economy. Um, I hope I, I hit that, uh, Sagai, but that, that's what I would focus on as diversification. Yes, sir. Um, I just, uh, great, thank you very much. Um, just thinking about some of those suggestions, you, uh, the implications uh, to like the cattle feedlot, just to take that one for example. Um, I'm sure that that resonates as a big change for current cattle feedlot owners. And so um, I guess I'm wondering, is, is there a, it seems like with other things that happen in life and also in agriculture, um, there, like maybe we'll hit a threshold where it's okay now, it's okay next year, it's okay next year, it's okay the next year to keep doing it the way we are, but at some point it's not going to be okay. Would be a prediction, right? Right. And I, is there? I know that's not necessarily your job, but but I know that um, uh, like Dr. Shulsky, I've I've heard her talk about that like um, the Lincoln uh, uh, Street Department is interested in like how many four inch snows do they get and what's the like if that's something meaningful to them um, that they want to track. And, um, is there so are are there thresholds that uh, that a person with your background can help uh, kind of predict like when we're gonna hit the, <laughs> the you better move now uh, moment. And, and I, I, I guess it's a little bit of a loaded question because you know that I'm on nibs just like you are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I haven't always gotten a warm reception. Just for those who don't know, nibs is the Nebraska Integrated Beef Systems Hub that was just formed and um, and that's actually kind of how I became a faculty member without having a PhD is because I keep getting invited to be on these faculty committees and somebody decided is that, well, perhaps you should be faculty. So getting back to, to the question is, is, is it this critical mass? And, and one of the arguments I made for NIBS, which really wasn't well received, I think there's this, this um, idea that I'm anti-beef and I've even tried to illustrate to those folks who felt that way that I was raising cattle up until four years ago. Uh, I come from a ranch. What I'm against is having somebody who expends all their energy and effort to a way of life only to find out next year, they got to completely retool and perhaps move. So one of the arguments I'm making is this is coming. So now is the best time to start to retool. 
It isn't retooling, like you said, is, is next year. So, but to the point of your question is, it's gonna be, is, since it is an economical, it's an economy, it's an economy device. It's an economy vehicle. That's what's driving feedlots and why they do what they do. It makes money. The critical mass that's gonna be reached, in my opinion, is at what point does the insurance premium on dead cattle exceed the value at which they can pay it because of the losses they're going to sustain. My argument is, is why don't you beat the horse out of the barn, close the doors, rather than let it run out of the barn and then spend the rest of the day trying to catch that horse and get it back in the barn because you're not going to. But the critical mass I think is gonna be economic because they're not going to, uh, they're not gonna do it for altruistic reasons. They're not gonna do it because it's the best thing to do. And that gets back to the question, should you, um, when we're talking about greenhouse gas emission, um, those of, the, of, the, of us that have studied greenhouse gas emission know that, that the beef industry in particular, and not necessarily in the United States, but the beef industry worldwide is a huge source of greenhouse gas. And it's not just methane, it's everything else that comes with it. And, I, and there was a Herman lecture just a few weeks ago, and it was interesting. The title of the, the Herman lecture was Cattle on Climate. Four panelists, not a single climatologist on that panel. All four were, were cattle people. They had nothing to do with climate. So my argument is they didn't even have, they really didn't even have a leg to stand on when they were addressing the climate side. But they were addressing the cattle side, trying to basically uh, propaganda themselves into this idea that what they were going to do with their, their new covered feedlot up at Mead were going to somehow mitigate all the issues with feedlots going into the future. Well, let's just, let's just take this as an argument since, since I, I'm grandstanding now. You cover a feedlot, you retain or capture that methane. And the idea is you want to age that methane out because methane does decay relatively rapidly in the atmosphere. What does it decay to? CO2. So what did you gain there? You gained, you gained something that really does like to trap a lot of long wave energy at the surface for something that also likes to trap long wave energy at the surface. But anyway, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, the, the idea is that if you grass finish, and I, and I know that I have some people on the, on the hub that agree with me, just change your paradigm. You don't have to give up the beef industry. You just have to change how the beef industry responds to the climate. I don't see any other questions. 